welcome the one, the only, Eliza Schlesinger! almost made it, didn't we, LA? Like, we almost got back to normal, right? We were so close. It's like a masked audience, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Nothing is normal. We were this close. We, all, we were almost had everyone pretending to believe in science. We were so close to getting it back. And our city is forever changed, right? Everything's worse and weirder. We've got a homeless problem no one's allowed to talk about. We got so many tents in this town, the whole city looks like an REI showroom. Like, it is a nightmare out there. And the weirdest thing to come out of this pandemic is that LA finally has the outdoor eating it should have always had. Why? Did it take an epidemic for us to be where we belong? We're supposed to be outside. Our weather is what we're known for. It's why people flock here. It's why our city has the highest concentration of delusional lunatics. Thank you for coming out, by the way. Like, and we finally got outside and everyone's acting like it's elegant to be eating outside. This isn't Paris. Like this is weird outdoor eating. There's nothing elegant about it. Like, oh my God, you guys, we're outside. You are eating behind a cement police barricade. Like in the gutter where the garbage goes next to a corpse. Like, and it's normal for us, we're like, we made it. I'm eating outdoors, I feel so good, mm, little gem lettuces, but it's not, it's like on every menu. It's not normal for the waiter, right? Like it's still really dystopian for the waiter, right? Like we all finally got our restaurants back a couple months ago, right? You couldn't wait to go out. You're sitting there outside, mask off, tits out. Like, oh, <laughs> let freedom ring. This is the way it should have been. Your waiter's in his own personal hell. If he comes up, you got your mask off. He's dressed like a welder. <laughs> I never come in general. You're like, do you want me to pull up to the next window? What is that? <laughs> I get this with some appetizers. <sighs> guy's just breathing into his own personal hurt locker. <laughs> and you're like, we're so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And it's interesting because everything about our city is different, but what didn't change is the required banter between waiter and customer, <laughs> right? Like, it's a pandemic. The waiter's like, welcome, so happy to have you. So have you, uh, have you dined with us before? No, <laughs> but I have eaten at a restaurant. Like, I <laughs> get the run of show. Can we hurry this up before there's another lockdown? Like, I don't need, I understand how this works. Well, we do things a little differently here. No, you don't. <laughs> You know, there's no, who in this room has ever been like floored by the information the waiter gave you subsequently? Like who's ever been driving home just wow, like wow, that was different, I'm so glad. <laughs> there was a disclaimer. <laughs> what waiter's ever been like, we do things differently. Tilt your head back, open up your goddamn throat. Like when has it ever <laughs> been that different? To say that things have gotten harder in the city of, city of angels. I've never called it the city of angels until just now. <laughs> to say that things have got harder, I think is an understatement. And to me, they've gotten harder and it's not even necessarily just the pandemic. Like things overall have gotten harder. Like every, you can't just go out to eat anymore. Remember? Like you, if you were hungry, you're like, no, we will remedy that with food nearby. You <laughs> cannot do that now. Everything is closed. There's no workforce. People don't want to, everything is small. Everything has limited seating. And I don't blame the pandemic. I blame the fact that we love a hipster aesthetic. <laughs> we love small batch. Remember like, oh, Cheesecake Factory. Ugh. We want, we want everything tiny. I want one scoop of lavender ice cream made every week for only six people. I want every restaurant run by two sisters from Brooklyn making one <laughs> spoonful of honey. Tiny. <laughs> like, we're in Koreatown right now. If you want to go to like a cool Instagram hipster place after this for dinner, you can't. It's closed. <laughs> Nothing is open. You can go to Burbank and there's like a Chili's, but that's about it. <laughs> Everything's cool. Go knock on any vegan cool hipster restaurant Instagram spot at like seven o'clock. Like, are you guys open? 
Kevin, I'm sorry, we're closed. We ran out of intention. <laughs> so I've got to wrap this up because we're about to bring out some very funny comics and I wanted to shed a little bit of light on why I wanted to do this show. Uh, you guys probably all work in show business. If not, what are you doing in this city? <laughs> Go back to Ohio while you can. <laughs> Get some land. <laughs> Have a normal family. This business is really difficult and I wanted to do a show where the comics chosen were chosen simply because they're funny. It's not a corporate mandate, there's no checklist, there's no expectation because I created it out of nothing because trends come and go but funny is forever. And all the comics on this show are people that I know, people that I've seen hustling, people that deserve a shot and nobody gave me a shot. I had to claw it out from the mouth of Hollywood and so I wanted <laughs> to just give some comics a break who I see working hard, who are funny, and tonight's gonna be so fun. So let's get it started. Welcome to Eliza's Local. So this comic coming to the stage is a big part of the reason that I wanted to do this show. I have watched this man grow as a comic. I've watched his fandom grow, his audience grow and he is one of my best friends. He's one of my favorite people. He's one of my favorite comics, and he's my baby bear. Put your hands together for Hunter Hill. How are you guys? Uh, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to do this. I'm so excited we can leave our houses again. Uh, I'll tell you, if there's one thing I did not miss during the pandemic, it was spending money going to other people's weddings. Uh, I didn't miss it. <laughs> I think I saved $10,000 last year. I think that's what I did. I'm not even against weddings. I love weddings. I'm Irish Catholic, so usually a wedding just means getting all of my uncles into one place and I get to watch them wrestle uh, <laughs> with, with their alcoholism, like it's a sexuality. <laughs> There's just so much pressure. I, I remember I was, I was dating a girl for four years. We went to a family wedding. Whenever you've been with anyone for that long and you go to a family wedding, there's always one aunt. She will find you. And she'll be like, when are you two tying the knot? And you go, take a lap, Aunt Susan. <laughs> you smell like box wine. <laughs> They're not serving that here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not against marriage. I've never been against it. I've just always wanted to be the best version of myself going into that chapter of my life. So when my aunt brought it up, it just sent me into this very real panic attack. And I found myself alone at a reception table, breathing way too hard. And, and, and my girlfriend found me, because uh, that, that's what they do. And, uh, <laughs> and she was like, hey, guy. Um, I can tell something's bothering you. And I feel like maybe we should talk about it. Like maybe I should know what that thing is. Uh-huh, 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 okay. Um, well, I guess what you should know is the way I picture the inside of your head is just an empty shelf with a kitchen timer on it that says marriage. And that thing is just tick. <laughs> Sidebar, just so we're all on the same page, I know it's 2021, okay? It doesn't have to be a kitchen timer, just the way I see it. Okay? She's the hardest working woman I've ever met in my entire life. Started her own company, has 40 employees. She's an entrepreneur, 30 years old. I tell dick jokes for money sometimes. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a kitchen timer. Just the way I see it. I just, I just know we are getting so close to that marriage timer. I'm not against it. I just know once that one goes off, all the other timers are going to start taking to be house, mortgage, kids, schools, minivans, sporting birthday parties, all these timers. Just trying to win them back, 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 trying to win them back. Finally, she grabs me. She goes, you need to calm down. There's no timers. That's not how the female brain works. We're just alone at this wedding. It feels like the first time in months I've been able to catch my breath. I'm just looking at her like. She goes, it's more of a fuse. <laughs> So I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. You're pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. We just, uh, we just celebrated our first wedding anniversary in quarantine. Uh, I loved it. I loved getting married. I, I loved her dress. I loved the open bar. I loved, uh, <laughs> I loved learning that my wife dances like she has a past that I don't know about. <laughs> Like, babe, I never knew you could dance. I've never thought you could dance like that. Your, your fingernails aren't bedazzled, and I care about you. <laughs> now we're trying for kids. It's a crazy thing. We're trying for kids. It's so much work. It's, it's the first time in my entire life that I felt like a utility. <laughs> this, 
this must be what our honeymoon felt like for her. Like, like, for me, we went to Bali. For my wife, she went to a haunted house of what corner is my husband naked and like kind of hard behind? <laughs> just us in a pool villa. I'm just like, how about now? <laughs> Now, now we're trying. I, I wish, I wish we were still on a tropical beach. I wish we were still in a location to make sense of the amount of sex that we're having. Now it's just like you just want me to have sex in Burbank and what? Think about how good the schools are. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it interesting. You know, we're we're trying Kama Sutra right now, um, which is great if if you want to make sex feel like putting IKEA furniture together. <laughs> I'm just trying to build a family with my wife. Instead, we're just in this office like, no, the book says that piece should be in there. <laughs> trying to be a dad. I hope we have a girl. I want a girl for the cookies. I, uh, <laughs> anyway, if we're being honest, Girl Scouts have the best cookies, okay? They raise $800 million a year for charity. They have a cookie called the Samoa that's so good it doesn't offend the Samoans. <laughs> And not to make friends or enemies out of anyone here, but Boy Scouts sell popcorn. They sell popcorn for like $26 a bag. Girl Scouts sell cookies for like $5 a box. So besides proving that a wage gap exists, I'm not sure what they're doing with the popcorn. <laughs> it's a weird thing. I'm starting to like try and look at myself and own every part of myself and be honest with who I am inside and out, just thinking about bringing a kid into this world. I think we were all just given this tremendous gift this last year. We all just had like a chance that we could reflect on ourselves, how we can be better, look at ourselves as a country, how we can be better. I looked inward. Not great. <laughs> Mostly corn syrup. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I, uh, I looked inward and uh, if I'm being honest with all of you, I found that I do have prejudicial behaviors. I'm, uh, I'm not proud of it. I'm, I'm definitely working on it. But I, I know that I do judge people by the way that they look. <sighs> like I, I was friends with a lot of them growing up. I, um, I should say, like, I don't care what color your skin is, where you're from, who you pray to, or who you are in love with, but if you're hot, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gorgeous, you're, and some of you might be, but Hunter, you're attractive. Those people are from Ohio. Nobody needs to think like that. <laughs> I am Old Navy Handsome in a town of Lululemon. I don't know why I live in Los Angeles. I can't even shop at normal stores. For, for a wedding, I went and I bought a new suit at a big and tall store, uh, which I was hesitant to do, mostly because I don't think of myself as fat. I, I think I would classify myself as uh, playfully obese. Um, <laughs> lava lamp-esque. <laughs> but I went, I went to big and tall, and I walked in, and it felt so good. First of all, so much air conditioning. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they know exactly how much I sweat from the car to the front door. I walked in, all the mannequins were bigger than I am. I'm just like, oh. I think I feel pretty. <laughs> Usually I'm just ashamed in a dressing room, throwing a bunch of clothes that don't fit into a dirty little corner because I'm a monster. This place, I'm throwing shirts over the door. Just, Philip, do we have anything smaller? All of this is too big. <laughs> My whole life, my whole life, I thought it was a triple XL. Turns out I've been a fat small the whole time. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think of myself as fat. I, 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 unless I'm at a theme park. If, I, if, I, if I'm at a theme park, life reminds me quite frequently how fat <laughs> Last time I was there, I, I went to a roller coaster with my friends. We all, we all went to get on. All my friends got on. They went click, 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 click. I got on. I went click, click. <laughs> this will be good. All of a sudden, the kid running the ride, he just goes, I'm sorry, sir, we're going to need two more clicks from you. <laughs> click, click. Sir, you're just saying that with your mouth. <laughs> now we're just having this staring contest. Uh, two more clicks, sir. Two more clicks, two more clicks. Finally, the guy just goes, shut it down. <laughs> Whole ride comes to a stop. All the emergency lights turn on. We're in line for an hour and a half. Everyone's just looking around like, is the ride broken? <laughs> I'm just looking down like, no. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and I got kicked off the ride for being too fat. Oh, no, no, no. I am from Los Angeles. Nobody who f lives here feels that way. Where are you guys from? <laughs> you guys feel things? 
You guys don't have to feel bad. Uh, you cut to me. I'm at the food court. I'm drinking all the domestic beer. I'm eating all of the hot. I'm at a table for one, just like, why does this always happen to me? Because here's the thing. I'm fat, but I'm not, shut it down, fat. Like, I should be able to fit. But that's life. That's ups and downs. I'm trying to get, like, get used to that idea of trying to become a parent. You know, I'm not always going to be in control. Sometimes it's going to be unfair. Don't always know what's going to happen. One morning, I was, uh, it's true, I was brushing my teeth one morning. I, I went to spit out my toothpaste. And physically, I couldn't. I looked up in the mirror and I realized that this left side of my face was completely paralyzed. I, I thought I was having a stroke. I, I went to my wife. She started hysterically crying immediately. She's like, we need to go to the hospital right now. I don't know if you guys have ever been six foot three and run into an emergency room, but the first thing they did was point it at my wife and go, did he hurt you? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just shuffling through the doors like men in black, just like, I need sugar water. <laughs> they rush us past everybody in line. They get me in front of some student doctors like I'm an episode of House. It wasn't lupus. <laughs> finally, finally a doctor gets in front of me. And she goes, Mr. Hill, I'm sorry, but your face is paralyzed because you picked up a rare viral disease called Bell's palsy. And your face is going to be paralyzed for the next six months. My first thought was, I need to audition for America's Got Talent. <laughs> I've been funny, but like now I have a backstory, and I've never had one of those before. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think if that show's taught us anything, it's that vulnerability isn't a weakness, you know? <laughs> Thinking about what that means, what it means to be a person, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a man, what it means to have character. When I was a kid, I was just this weird little musical theater nerd. And I remember every man having an opinion on what type of man I was supposed to grow up to be. I remember getting a fight with my stepdad in middle school. He said, I just don't understand you. You don't play sports. You don't go to parties. You have no character. I was like, I have my own makeup kit and know how to tap dance. How many characters do you need? <laughs> Thank you guys very much. My name's Hunter Hill. Thank you. Coming to the stage next, this woman is my best friend. Uh, we met at a small show in a bar that doesn't exist anymore, above a restaurant that doesn't exist anymore, and we've been best friends ever since. She is, and I can say this and mean it, one of the best comics in Los Angeles. She deserves everything. Put your hands together for my best friend, Jody Miller. <laughs> just kept screaming the whole set, just woo! Oh my God. So, I am a new mom. Yes, and that definitely deserves applause. That definitely deserves applause. Uh, my daughter is six months old. Aww. And also in the car, so I have to talk fast. It's fine, she can't drive, we're good. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think she can. If she can, I'm getting wasted tonight, so there you go. <laughs> I know a lot of women struggled with the baby weight. I was actually really lucky. I lost it immediately, which actually wasn't hard because she's adopted, so there you go. <laughs> Super easy pregnancy. I drank all the way through it. So good. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. I don't know if you guys know anything about adoption, but the first thing you need to decide if you decide to adopt is do you want brand new or previously owned? <laughs> now, I went with brand new because I love that new baby smell, right? <laughs> Hers is actually starting to wear off. It's a little annoying. Uh, <laughs> After that, you have to put together a profile. You have to put together a digital profile of you doing outdoorsy things like hiking, kayaking, you with your friends, you with your friends' kids, you with your friends' dogs, you in the holidays, making you look like a well-rounded person, all in hopes of matching with a birth mom. So it's exactly like online dating, except at the end, you get a baby on purpose. <laughs> Most people have several months once they match with a birth mom. I had less than 24 hours. Uh, I sent my stuff in. Two hours later, my lawyer called me. He's like, you've been selected. Your baby was born. You need to get on a plane tomorrow and go to Kentucky. And that was the most traumatic thing about this entire experience. <laughs> 
Yeah. Going to Kentucky. <laughs> the first time I met my daughter was exactly like a first date. Like, I didn't know what to make of her. She didn't know what to make of me. She was a lot shorter than her picture. She was preemie. She was six weeks early, so she was really tiny. And it's funny because all the nurses went out of their way to talk about how perfectly round her head was. She was small, but she had a perfectly round head. Your daughter's head is so round. Normally, when it comes out vaginally, it's just pulled out just like an egg, but your daughter's head is so round. Francine, come in here and look at this little girl's head. Your head is so round. <laughs> and then I found out this was the birth mother's 13th pregnancy. Yeah, 13. Of course her head was perfectly round. <laughs> she walked out of that vagina. I honestly think she came six weeks early because she wanted to get the hell out of Kentucky. <laughs> she was like, oh, that's the woman from L.A.? I'm out of here. Let's go. <laughs> Grab my stuff. The birth mother also named my daughter. I didn't know this, we have an open adoption, but on all the paperwork, it just said baby girl and her last name. But when I got there and I walked into the room, there it was, her name all over the wall, Harmony. <laughs> she named it Harmony. And you could tell all the nurses were just dying to know what I was gonna do. They're like, you gonna keep it? <laughs> you gonna keep that name Harmony? I'm like, I would rather keep baby girl. <laughs> I would rather my daughter's name be Baby Girl Miller. <laughs> no offense to any harmonies out there, melodies, crescendos. I love all the musical. <laughs> not, that's not what I was going to do. Uh, a lot of things have to happen before you're even discharged. One of the things they make you do is they make you watch a baby shaking video. <laughs> Yeah, there is a baby shaking video. And of course, my first thought was like, oh my God, I don't need to watch a baby shaking video. I know how to shake a baby. <laughs> they make you watch it and then they just keep reminding you, don't shake the baby. I'm like, I would never shake the baby. They're like, but watch the video and don't shake the baby. I'm like, I'm not gonna shake the baby, but watch the video, make sure you have a support team, take deep breaths, walk out of the room, just make sure you have a plan and don't shake the baby. I'm like, look, I know people shake the baby, but I'm not one of those people. I'm never gonna shake the baby. I would never shake a baby. It's never ever occurred to me to shake a baby. Cut to a month later without any sleep and I'm like, I'm gonna shake the baby. <laughs> You have no control. It's like your hands are just guided towards the baby. <laughs> and in your sleep-deprived mind, it sounds like the baby is saying, shake me. <laughs> shake me. <laughs> they just fucking veer to the right and just pick up my cat and start shaking him. <laughs> my cat's like, why are you shaking me? I know how to sleep. All my friends without kids keep asking the same question. They're like, are you loving it? Are you just loving motherhood? And all my friends with kids ask, are you okay? <laughs> Do you need more Xanax? <laughs> my life has changed so much so quickly that I have whiplash. Guys, six and a half months ago, I was doing shrooms. <laughs> Last night, I stuck a plastic whistle device up my daughter's butt to make her poop. <laughs> Yeah, that's when I realized how much my life has changed. It's also when I realized that my daughter is way too comfortable with butt stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she obviously gets that from her birth mom because I'm not into that, okay? <laughs> I mean, no judgment, just not my thing. Uh, it's a lot of things I didn't know. I was a nanny, I was a babysitter, just things you don't know until you're actually a parent. Like, why are pacifiers shaped like tiny penises? They are. Next time you look at one, just look like, who designed that? They're all tiny little penises and they're just all over my house. It's like a bachelorette party just threw up in there. And my daughter's teething, so she's just like deep throating them in the middle of the night with this crazed look at her face, like, ah! Now that she gets from me. <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs>
Everyone's like, now that you have a baby, is that all you're going to talk about on stage? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I got her. I ran out of material. <laughs> I'm kidding. I could never run out of material because I'm still single. So there you go. <laughs> Ladies, I don't know if you know this, but if you're still single and you're in your 40s, it's your fault. <laughs> Your fault, okay? Because when I was single in my 20s, everyone was like, oh my God, don't even sweat it. Date everyone, have fun. Then when I was single in my 30s, everyone's like, well, you're doing the work. You made a vision board. I don't know. <laughs> then when I was single in my 40s, everyone's like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Stop mouth kissing your cat and get married already. <laughs> Thought of getting on a dating app, though, is just so nauseating. Because, like, when you're on a dating app and you're in your 40s, it's like shopping in Marshalls. <laughs> it's like you know everything in there is crap. <laughs> and then you remember, oh, I'm in there. Oh. <laughs> they are great for hookups, though. They're definitely great for hookups. Sometimes I would purposely pick a guy who said he was allergic to cats because I knew he could only last about 30 minutes. <laughs> Just bring him home, you have sex, it's like minute 35. He's like, oh my God, my allergies are so bad, I can't breathe. I'm like, well then you better go. You need to go, sir. <laughs> then my, my cat and I just high five each other. <laughs> I can't even think about getting naked. It's like everything changes when you get older. I, I truly believe that my ass and my face are in a competition to see get to the ground first. That's what's happening. <laughs> My ass is winning. You guys don't know this because I'm just wearing like tight black jeans, but I used to have a thigh and I used to have an ass and now I have a thass. That's what I have. <laughs> it was like one day my ass was like, you know what? I'm exhausted. And my thigh was like, well, you can rest here because all are welcome. <laughs> guys used to be like, oh, Jody, your ass is so tight. And now they're going to be like, oh, your ass is so continuous. There it is, all the way down. <laughs> as far as the face. I mean, my motto is fill it and freeze it. I'm just like, stick as many needles in there. Don't make them. Like, I have so much Botox in my neck, people, I can't swallow correctly, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> Women don't like to talk about any work they've had done, and I wish they would. I really do. Because if you do something that makes you feel good, you should share it, at least with your friends. Celebrities lie about it all day long, just setting up unrealistic expectations. You ask a celebrity, oh my God, you look so good. What's your secret? Should be like, I got cinnamon out of my diet. <laughs> Game changer. If you ask me, you look so good. What's your secret? I will tell you. I get Botox and filler, and I have sex with a 27-year-old and slowly drain his youth. <laughs> I ended it with a 27-year-old because, obviously, he turned 28. Gross. I realize there are two different types of women out there. Women that watch The Real Housewives and women that watch true crime and serial killer documentaries. Yeah. yeah. Guys, you want to be with the girls that watch serial killer documentaries. Because we appreciate the little things, okay? Now, the women that watch The Real Housewives are great, but they love drama. They say they don't, but they do. They like to secretly imagine what their lives would be like if they had all that money. But us girls that watch the serial killer documentaries are just grateful for what we have because we know how horrific our lives could get. <laughs> like, oh, you're having a bad day? Well, at least you're not in a friggin' trunk, eh? Huh? <laughs> Did your boyfriend break up with you? Just be grateful he didn't carve his name in your torso. You're doing just fine. Take a Xanax. <laughs> My name is Jody Miller. Thank you guys so much. Comic. I was actually at a show to see another comic, and this guy caught my eye. I think you're gonna love him. Put your hands together for the very funny John Taylor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate all the positive energy. I actually needed. Uh, I got cheated on this week. Aww. Worst part about it is I got cheated on by my side chick, and um, <laughs> that completely caught me off guard. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you can't trust your side chick, who can you trust these days? There should be somebody out there. And I was her side chick. She was in a bad relationship. I was in a bad relationship. And we decided to do this thing. And then she just goes, John, I just think we should see other people. 
I go, woman, we are the other people, okay? That's what <laughs> this is. So I didn't want to, like, just take it, but I'm not, like, a fighter. I just went through her phone, and I called her boyfriend. I was like, yo, Sandra's cheating on us. <laughs> what do you want to do? How do you propose we proceed? So he goes, you mean to tell me my fiancé of five years, who I'm supposed to marry next month, is cheating on me? And then it hit me, like, this dude is so selfish. Don't make it all about you, okay? I'm going through. What about me? So I'm in a bad relationship, and I don't want to be in it. Then I'm getting cheated on by some girl I've never been in a relationship with. Like, at some point, you just run out of Drake songs. There's just not enough Drake <laughs> out there to get you through your day. Uh, I had some good news happen to me, too. I got invited to apply for a black card. Any black card holders in the audience? No? We're all broke? Okay, let me explain. Um, <laughs> Black Cars is this car made by American Express, made completely out of metal. You can buy whatever you want with it, like cars, yachts, slaves, whatever you need <laughs> to get you through your rich life. But I always slide it because I didn't get like the American Express version. I got the MasterCard. I didn't want a second rate version of the black car. Like I didn't want the light skin, green eye, wavy hair version <laughs> of the black car. Like I want my black car to be so black that police shoot it on the arm. Like that's how black <laughs> I want my black car to be. I want black card to be so black that it's made out of vibranium and it says Wakanda on it. Like, that's how black <laughs> I want my black card to be. I want my black card to be so black that I get 4% cash back on child support. Like, that's... <laughs> that's how black I want my black card to be, you know? So I got goals to get there. Um, I'm trying to save money. What you're looking at is about, like, $80 at excellence, and I'm gonna let you know I got it at Ross. Um, <laughs> And if you don't know, let me put you on the game. Ross is a store for broke people with FU money. Like, whenever you got, like, $75 American, take it to Ross, it turns into $120 clearance really fast. <laughs> the only problem is I don't like the way they treat you. As soon as you get in the score, you're greeted by loss prevention. Your face is on a security camera. Like, Ross is if jail had a gift shop, you know? Just calm <laughs> down. And what are you guarding? The shirts are on the floor with fingerprints. <laughs> the shoes are never matched up together. What I'm trying to say is Ross is the only store to sell evidence. Like, <laughs> this is not just my outfit. This is somebody's cold case right here, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's too intense, too intense. I am dating. Uh, I'm trying online dating, but it's not working for me because I look like this, but I sound like this. So, like, when people meet me in person, they're like, uh, you don't look like the commercial, you know? Like, it's not what I thought I was getting. But I play to my strengths. Like, I know what I am. I'm like the marijuana black dude, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you're dating a Chad, don't go straight to a Trayvon. Get you a John Taylor to make that transition. <laughs> Let me show you the way of hot sauce. Like, I will, I will get you prerequisites, you know? It's, it's, let me guide you. The reason, like, and, and I'm still scarred from my last relationship. Like, I just got out of an eight-year relationship, and I'm fresh out. Like, it's only been about four years. And um, <laughs> what's, what's happening is she won't let me move on. She keeps posting from our joint Yelp account that we had when we were together. So every time she goes out with a new boo, I get the notification about how awesome the date was. <laughs> like, her last review was like, it was cool to go to Benihana and not have to use a $30 gift certificate, John Taylor. I was like, okay, that's, <laughs> that's a little personal. And then she's like, the drinks were kind of weak, the food portions, they were small, but the sex, five stars. <laughs> Worst part about that review is like eight people found it useful. So now I'm just that guy <laughs> with bad sex and gift certificates. And I'm so much more than that. I turned 36 this year, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, as a black man, that's an achievement, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and before, before the pandemic hit, like, I celebrate my birthday at the Queen Mary. I don't know if you guys have been. It's the hotel in Long Beach. Like, it's permanently docked. The ship that goes nowhere. Um, and I'm in brunch on this thing, and I realize as a black man, I've made it, okay? On a, as a black man, let me explain. My ancestors came over here on a slave ship. I'm now on a ship that's built for royalty, eating waffles, made to order omelets, apple to cup bacon, right? Just living it up. So I think every black person should experience this brunch. And if I'm being honest, a white person should have to pay for it because <laughs> white people, you owe us a good time on a ship, okay? That needs to be <laughs> cast in. And it can't be like a dolphin cruise. It can't be whale watching. It has to be the Queen Mary for these two reasons. One, 
It has to be a ship that's built for royalty, okay? That's, that's number one. And two, and this is the important part, that ship can't go nowhere. <laughs> where I get on is where I get off. Just not going to fall for the dumb again, okay? All right, my name is John Taylor. Love you guys. This comic uh, is a newer friend of mine. He runs a show in LA that is just awesome, and he was so generous and let me hijack his lineup so I could book all the comics that I wanted to get a look at for my show. He's hilarious. His comedy has such a point of view. He's from the East Coast. You're about to find out exactly where. Put your hands together for Maddie Fontana. <laughs> How are you guys? Good to see you. You look like a million bucks, man. I know, I got, yeah, I would call the elephant out in the room. I got a Boston accent. I'm from South Boston. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yep. Woo! Yeah. I know my accent makes me sound like I have a problem, like a severe problem with gender neutral pronouns. <laughs> I, do, I know, and I'm fine with it. I'm fine. But, you know, don't think I don't see the differences between men and women. Like, a man will never call his ugly friend a goddess. <laughs> oh my God, Bertha, your hair, that dress, you're a goddess. <laughs> but ladies, you're compassionate, you're kind, you try to build each other up. Men, we don't do that. We're horrible. Your worst quality is your nickname. See that dude over there? His name is Marty Scarpaglio. We call him Morgmouth Marty because he's got 15 dead teeth and his breath smells like the inside of a tennis ball. <laughs> that guy over there, Chucky O'Houlihan. We call him Jesus because he's got a dad, but he's never met him or seen him, but he believes he's out there. <laughs> and that guy over there that looks like Scotty Jankowski, he looks like he's leaning on the air. We call him Scotty Scoliosis. He's got scoliosis. <laughs> yeah, I grew up, I'm a weird dude, man. I'm a weird dude. I grew up, like, I grew up in South Boston in the mid '90s, and um, <laughs> I. Um, recently was told by this woman that my accent makes me sound illiterate. <laughs> and it hurt my feelings because I got kept back in the third grade because I couldn't read. I'm, I was illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> and to put it into perspective, you ate in the third grade. That's when you first stopped playing Little League. If you don't have an older brother, you still believe in Santa Claus. So I'm nine in the third grade, and I go through puberty full force. Full force. So weird. Nine years old, going through puberty. I was trying to hold it in. Like Michael J. Fox at the beginning of Teen Wolf when he's changing into the wolf. He's just sweating. Like you're two blocks away from your house. You're sitting at a red light, and you got diarrhea, and you're on your toes just like picking your ass up off the seat. I had a grown man's penis. You ever try to stuff a grown man's penis into a pair of Oshkosh bagashes? <laughs> Mortifying. My voice started changing. When my voice started changing, it didn't do it like regular boys. I sounded like Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> my teacher was like, Mr. Fontana, did you want to come to the front of the class and read your homework? I'm like, I'm going through something right now. Call on somebody else, man. When you go through puberty, your body's super sensitive. My body was like an Apple TV remote control. <laughs> and I had a really pretty young teacher, and I had a crush on her. And she would walk up and down the aisles, checking people's homework, just seeing what people were doing. She put her hand on my shoulder, my lunch money shot out of my pocket like a confetti can. <laughs> Embarrassing. It's just embarrassing. <laughs> a couple years later, my brother came out of the closet. It's gay. Because <laughs> that's the only way you can come out of the closet. 
he's gay. And uh, we were terrified because Southie's a tough town. You've seen the movies, you know, The Departed, Goodwill Hunting, you know. Everybody's scary. So my parents, I don't know why they did this, they gave him a bedroom in the basement. <laughs> he was no longer in the closet. He's down by the Christmas decorations. <laughs> but growing up there, you, when you're from Southie, you're one of us. Like, everybody accepted him. And we, we had nothing to worry about. But it didn't stop them from asking me ignorant questions. One dude was like, does he ever try to touch a dick? <laughs> and I'm like, no, Terry. Now I'm wondering what the family dynamic is in the Flaherty household. <laughs> <laughs> He's my brother. He's not your uncle. <laughs> Another dude was like, why would you choose that? Why would you choose to be that way? Why would you choose that lifestyle? I'm like, it ain't a choice, you ignorant asshole. You either are or you're not born with a gay older brother. <laughs> and then another dude was like, because your brother's gay, that means you're gay. And I'm like, that's sound logic. What do you think, my parents are pure breeding homosexuals? That would be a very interesting Dateline episode, wouldn't it? <laughs> Lester Holt standing out in front of my parents' house. <laughs> Some people purebreed bagels. Others purebreed Siamese cats. But with Sheila and William Fontana are purebreeding in this two-bedroom walk-up in South Boston, Massachusetts, got a couple of the neighbors raising an eyebrow. It's <laughs> my favorite thing about gay people. My brother, his friends, the way they describe things. The way, the way they tell a story, they, it's just, their imaginations are so incredible. They have the most, you know, descriptive adjectives. That's why I didn't delete Facebook. <laughs> because gay men memorialize dead celebrities better than anybody on the planet. <laughs> Straight dudes, we're terrible, right? We're awful. We're like, R.I.P. David Bowie. I was getting a hand job while I was listening to Changes when I was five. <laughs> Not gay dudes. Gay dudes are the best. Gay dudes are like January 26, 1985, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A confused and lonely young boy teaches himself how to play the violin in the driveway of a crumbling ranch house. His nun nun and pop pop were his caregivers. Well, his father, absent since birth, is on tour with an in excess cover band playing rhythm guitar. And his mother is in a rehab facility being cured off of quaaludes in Seagram 7. <laughs> a velvety cloud opens up over the boy, and a purple rain showers on him. So he runs inside seeking shelter, grabbing his grandmother's wool gabardine jacket and laying stomach down on the living room carpet that reeks of manual labor and domestic violence. <laughs> His plump sister, Bertha, bounds into the living room like a hippopotamus in a shallow pond and snaps on the 27-inch Zenith console television. <laughs> the channel, MTV. Kurt Loder is finishing giving us our daily dish of world news when a music video begins and a man appears through a fog wearing purple and paisley, silk and satin, leather and lace. His words touch the soul of the young boy and he no longer feels alone. He no longer feels afraid. He feels confident and seen. He imagines himself driving around in a little red Corvette, wearing a raspberry beret, partying like it was 1999. From that day forward, he was purple, he was paisley, he was silk, he was satin, he was leather, he was lace. That little boy was me, and that man was the purple one. Rest easy, sweet prince, because in heaven you have found an equal in God. My name's been Maddie Fontana, thank you so much. I heard from a lot of comics who I really love that she's funny, so I asked her to come feature for me at the Irvine Improv one weekend. Not only was she funny and unique, she's the only woman I've ever been in a green room with that ate more than I did. And I was like, you're a winner, baby. Put your hands together for Irene, too. Oh, my God. Hello. 
I am a girl. <laughs> I know, I gotta clear that up. Some of you are like, is that a teenage Asian boy on stage? Uh, nope, just a lesbian. Uh, but I did skateboard here, so <laughs> kind of both. I hate going through airport security because every time I go, um, I have to go through that big full body machine. You know, the one where you pose for three seconds and then it tells you if you're a terrorist or not. <laughs> but I don't know if you know this, when you go through that machine, the agent actually has to pick your gender. That's how the machine works. So since I look like me, he was picks male. Uh, then I go through the machine and then he's like, ah, fuck, we gotta do it again. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean we have to do it again? <laughs> okay, you messed up. I feel like you just have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, even if I was carrying a bomb, just let me keep it, okay? <laughs> That's good customer service. <laughs> so they make me go through the machine twice, so I'm getting cancer twice as fast. <laughs> Very fun. But usually when I go through the first time, the machine will go off, so the guy comes over, he starts patting me down. I don't say anything because it's nine in the morning, I'm tired, also it does nothing for me. <laughs> so he starts patting me down, and at right about uh, here, he realizes that he's wrong. <laughs> then you can just see the color drain from his face. He's like, oh my God, this might be sexual harassment. <laughs> and that just makes my day. Okay. <laughs> Because he thinks I'm going to sue him. I'm not. But you don't know that. So <laughs> I just walk away and I wave and I wink. You know? It's like a fun little game I like to play. So I am gay, and I don't know if anyone else in here is gay or... Yeah, or knows a gay person. That should cover it. Uh, <laughs> like, at this point, if you don't know anyone who's gay, uh, you're gay. I actually knew I was gay my whole life because growing up, my favorite color was blue. A very suspect move for a girl. <laughs> Wore a lot of overalls. And the only Barbie I ever owned was always uh, naked. <laughs> yeah, you know you buy little girls Barbies so they buy more clothes, they dress her up. <laughs> I was like, nah, <laughs> she's fine the way she is. <laughs> Barbie wants to go skinny dipping every night. <laughs> very creepy. But I didn't come out to my mom for a really long time because I thought she wasn't going to be cool with it. And finally, when I was 19, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell her. I go, Mom, I'm gay. And she goes, I know. <laughs> Look at your hair. <laughs> and that was it. That was the entire conversation. <laughs> Very easy. So I would highly recommend coming out to my mom. Uh, <laughs> she already knows you're gay, you know? <laughs> you guys probably can't tell this about me just uh, looking at me, but I do eat meat. Yes, thank you. Um, I have to say that because everyone assumes I'm vegan for some reason. <laughs> I don't know what it is about me. Like, if it's because I look gay or frail. Uh, <laughs> people are like, yeah, that girl has dietary restrictions. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's like, I'm also Asian, okay? We eat all of the meats. <laughs> when my mom and I make chicken soup, we drive to Chinatown. We pick a chicken that's still alive. We're like, that one's the fattest. They kill it before our eyes. We don't even pray. <laughs> then we bring it home, cook it for four hours, and I eat the entire chicken, including the eyes, the beak, and the brain, okay? Like, I know how to eat meat. So I'm really sick of when people are like, oh, I like chicken nuggets. What you do is gross. Like, okay, fine, you like chicken nuggets? You know what those are? Those are just shredded up chicken butts, okay? <laughs> What's really grosser? I ate two eyeballs. You ate 500 assholes. <laughs> Pretty sure it's the chicken butts, okay? You don't know where that chicken's been. I miss talking to audiences because I would ask them uh, what celebrity they think I looked like, you know, my doppelganger. And then I had to stop because people were mean. <laughs> yeah. Someone in the audience would always shout out, uh, you look like the guy from The Hangover. First of all, that's not a name, okay? <laughs> Second of all, we all know who you're talking about. Bradley Cooper. <laughs> Put one time, someone in the audience said, uh, no, you kind of look like Jeremy Lin, the <laughs> basketball player. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's racist again. Okay. 
<laughs> like, we're nothing alike. He went to Harvard to play basketball, and I actually got into college. <laughs> and he's Taiwanese, and I'm from a real UN-recognized country. <laughs> America, okay? <laughs> Just kidding, I know Taiwan is real, okay? I was forced to say otherwise by the Chinese government. <laughs> Please don't get offended by that joke. My ex-girlfriend is actually Taiwanese. Uh, and a hater. Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you guys so much. I'm Irene, too. This comic is a talented musician, a hilarious comedian. I have had the privilege of working with him on many projects. I'm so proud to bring him here tonight. Put your hands together for Avery Pearson! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Oh, you guys are beautiful. I'm a different kind of comedian. We're gonna do uh, some songs, have some fun, sing along, sound good? Um, I actually uh, just became a father for the second time. Okay, no parents here. <laughs> I grew up in Toronto. My parents were too nice to me. Gave me allowance till I was 33. All I ever spent that on was weed. I'm not equipped to be a father. I can barely take care of myself. I'm vegan and I'm fat. How the fuck did I manage that? I eat mac and cheese at 4 a.m. This is good. Um, thank you so much for coming out. You're beautiful people. I have a, a wonderful, uh, caring, supportive wife that gave me two beautiful children. And um, I'm just like a really lucky guy. And I wanted to sort of change the mood a little bit in here and just play a beautiful love song that I wrote for her. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, so this goes out to all the mothers and all the mother lovers. <laughs> Met you when we were 31. We used to have fun. We used to go for runs. We used to have sex all the time. And by that I mean twice a week. And then you said, let's get married. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> then you said, now I want a baby, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so we had a baby, now I'm fucking exhausted. It doesn't feel like when we met, but you crawl in the bed, you got those worn out sweats. I got a chubby that's ready for some sweet, sweet sex. I said, sweetie, you look so beautiful. You look like the sun, the moon, and the stars. And you said, I'm tired and I'm bloated. <laughs> oh, it's hard to get your dick sucked when you're raising a child. When you're raising a child. It's hard to get your dick sucked when you're raising a child. When you're raising a child. Just the guys, it's hard to get your dick sucked when you're raising a child. Let me hear you guys. Here we go. It's hard to get your dick sucked when you're raising a child. When you're raising. Now, just the ladies. jerk off into the toilet uh, uh, 
Thanks, ladies. <laughs> um, so I, I love writing comedy songs, and when terrible, shitty things happen in my life, I write a funny song about it. And um, <laughs> I recently went to the doctor, and I got some interesting news. I'm going to share it with you. This is a bit of a sing-along. Are you going to sing along with me? If the moment happens, is it you going to sing along with me? Yeah. I always used to ask for a extra squeeze of me. I want my deep fried macaroni and cheese. I love food so much, my sweat is gravy. I'm the kind of guy that's gonna lose his feet. Cause I got diabetes, you got diabetes. My Jews got diabetes. Babe Ruth probably had diabetes. Stop one, diabetes, it's fun. Trap two, diabetes. Woohoo! I had to make a change, cause I had a kid. Now everything I eat is mm, solid. Kale, quinoa, spinach, broccoli, and red peas. Dehydrated apricots are my only treat. Cause I got diabetes. You got diabetes. My Jews got diabetes. Larry King had diabetes. Top one, diabetes. it's fun. Diabetes. Oh, top two. Soda, but only just one. I can down a hard kombucha if I want to have some fun. Oh, I'm gonna change my act. So my next song isn't heart attack. Cause I got diabetes. You got diabetes. My juice got diabetes. Top one. Diabetes. It's fun. Diabetes. Diabetes. Let's do it again. Now I you got my twos got oh baby Ruth and top one it's fun thank you so much